pages 55 to 74, Away in a Manger. Christmas was in the air, and Miss Butler had us girls making gifts in home ec class. We ought to have been learning invisible mending and turning hems to make our clothes last, but Miss Butler decreed hot pads for our loved ones, made by crocheting used bottle caps into circular patterns. Ina Ray was my crocheting partner, and she was all thumbs with a crochet hook. Her hot pad bunched up in the middle like a skull cap. She wore it on her head until Miss Butler told her to take it off. I couldn't picture giving Grandma a hot pad made out of bottle caps crocheted together, so I let Ina Ray have mine for her mother. I hadn't thought about giving Grandma anything. Somehow I didn't think Grandma and Christmas went together. I was lucky to have Ina Ray, though. Carlene Lovejoy was still looking straight through me, and she set the tone for the rest of the girls. I hadn't made a lot of headway in all these weeks. Ina Ray heard Gertrude Messerschmidt tell Mona Veach that I wasn't as pushy as they thought I'd be, but that was as far as I got. If there was one point in my favor, it was that I wasn't as well-dressed as they feared. I had two wool skirts. One had been mother's. The other belonged mostly to the moths. With my three sweaters, I could get through the week, but I was hurting for shoes, and my winter coat was a disgrace. Carlene had five different outfits, top to toe, for every day in the week. She always wore silk stockings on Fridays, though some of her shoes may have been her mother's. Her sweater, with a drawstring neckline and pom-poms, was much admired. But as Carlene said in her airy way, considering the boys in our school, there wasn't much point in looking your best. But now Christmas was coming in the annual school Christmas program, so we all had to pull together. The entire student body was to be the chorus, though half of us couldn't carry a tune if it had handles. When Miss Butler ran us through Angels We Have Heard on High, we sounded like starlings in a tree. There was to be a nativity scene, and she assigned us parts. Joseph, the three kings, and some shepherds just about exhausted the supply of boys. Nobody wanted Augie Fluke on the stage. His hair was growing out, but he looked like a plucked chicken. The girls' parts were for baby Jesus' mother and a heavenly host of angels. The idea that a boy could be an angel never occurred to Miss Butler. The school was rocked by the news that I was to play baby Jesus' mother. I was surprised myself. Someone was heard to remark, what was Miss Butler dreaming of? A Chicago girl playing the Virgin Mary? The idea. It was Carlene. As we had to come up with our own costumes, I thought I could get by with bed sheets. The program was all the Christmas some of us would have. Money was tighter than last year. The two topics in everybody's mind there at the end of 1937 were something to eat and money. Not that I ever went hungry at Grandma's, but there was hunger around, and with Grandma, money remained a mystery. I made my way home from school one early December day, scooping snow with my open-toed shoes. Strangely, Grandma wasn't home. Just at dusk, when I was up in my room, still wearing my old plaid coat, something drew me to the window. Coming up the road by the Wabash tracks was a fearful figure, a lumbering hump shape bent into the swirling snow. Its head was swathed in something. Strapped to its back was a long wicker basket. Its boots left black footprints behind. I hugged my skimpy coat tight and felt the empty house around me. The figure was at our fence line when it looked up at my window and me. It was Grandma. I was down in the kitchen as she came in, shaggy with snow. She slung the big basket aside. Then she untied the shawl that held her hat on. She flung Grandpa Dowdle's old coat on a chair before the fire. Underneath, she was wearing Grandpa's rubber chest waders that were like rubber bib overalls. They stained across her, strained across her bosom and pulled at the shoulder straps. She was all in black rubber, almost up to her chins. Of all the figures she ever cut, this one took the cake. I often wondered what she buried Grandpa Dowdle in. She seemed to wear every stitch that he'd owned. Chilly out there, she rubbed her big red hands together. My teeth is chattering like a woodpecker with palsy. Grandma, why 
are you out tramping in the countryside in this weather? For snow, she explained. It's my busy season. It's all work, work, work. I'll die standing up like an old ox. What good would it do me to question her more? I peered into the tall wicker basket. It was half full of shells, walnut holes. They didn't, that didn't tell me a thing. I'll admit the scene of grandma fighting her way out of all that rubber beside the heat of the stove. It was like shedding a skin. Below it, she wore two crumpled house dresses and a cardigan sweater. Under that, a quick peek of long-handled flannel underwear, a union suit, grandpa's. At the supper table, I mentioned that Miss Butler had picked the parts for the Christmas program. I confided that I was baby Jesus' mother. They still doing nativity scenes, Grandma said. We done them when I was a country girl in the one-room schoolhouse. What part did they give you? Joseph, she said, and once it was a camel. I was always the biggest. After I dried the dishes, I opened up my homework. They had homework down here, too, sadly. Miss Butler could really dole it out. Mr. Herkimer was no slouch. Grandma sat at the other end of the table, nodding while I tried to diagram some sentences. I moved on to biology, falling into rhythm of Grandma's snore. A Seth Thomas steeple clock stood on a high shelf. When it struck ten, Grandma jerked awake. She looked around the room, astonished. It was her belief that she never slept, not even in bed. Is that the time? She pointed down the table at me. You better get booted and bundled up. She was out of the chair, shaking down the stove. Now she reached for her hat and shawl and felt Grandpa's coat to see if it was dry. I clutched my forehead. Grandma, it's the dead of night. But it's a moonlit night. She shimmied into her chest waders and she stuffed her skirt tails inside. Grandma, it's a school night. I need my sleep. Sleep? You'll sleep your life away and rot in bed. You better pull on two pair of socks under your galoshes. I had galoshes, but I hated wearing them. Grandma, where are we going? After a character who's smarter than we are, she said, struggling into the coat, clenching her jaw. When I came back to the kitchen, layered like Admiral Byrd, Grandma was rummaging through the mysterious wicker basket. She took inventory of various things buried in the walnut holes, a coil of her picture wire, a handful of wooden stakes. She drew forth a small glass vial of some amber liquid. With a sly look my way, she uncorked it and passed it under my nose. I reeled back. Grandma, that smells nasty. Depends on who's doing the smelling, she rummaged on, coming up with what looked like a rabbit's foot. It was something furry off a rabbit. What's that for, Grandma? Good luck? Ah, uh, you might say so. She stood to hoist the basket onto her shoulder. Then she remembered and made for a knife drawer in the Hoosier cabinet. Out of the drawer, she drew a gun. I froze. It was nothing like the blunderbuss behind the wood box. It was, in fact, a single shot twenty-two pistol. But I didn't know about that. Then, there was a lot I didn't know. Slipping the pistol into her pocket, she marched us both out the door into the night. We trod the icy ridges of the road, and the town fell back behind us. A cold, cloudless moon glared on white fields. I walked in Grandma's shadow, hearing the basket thump her back and the walnut holes dance to her step. Of course, I should be sound asleep in bed by now, and I couldn't feel my toes. And Grandma was packing a pistol. But it was beautiful out here, like a black and white Christmas card. The ice on the woven wire fences was a latticework of diamonds. And only Grandma and I were awake in all this stillness. At least, I hope so. We must have walked halfway to Cowgill's farm before she nudged me off the road. We jammed a gate against a drift and entered someone's field. The snow was deeper here. Grandma led the way as we kept to the fences to the far corner of the field. She put up a hand to hold me back. She wore railroader's gloves. And then I heard the scream. A scream too human from down in the dipping corner of the field that the moon missed, and an answering scream froze in my throat. Grandma shrugged out of the basket and whipped that pistol from her pocket. A moonbeam glanced the black metal of the narrow barrel as she aimed into the dark corner where the two fences met. She fired straight into the screen. My knees begged to buckle. She was down on all fours now, the black coat fanning out in the snow. 
her hands busy. She worked intently, biting off one glove to use her bare hand to do whatever she was doing. She tugged at a wire and powdery snow shook loose off a fence post. Metal clicked. Then she pulled back and held him up by the neck. It was a fox, red, though black in the moonlight. His head lolled against her fist. His eyes were black beads, but he was dead, drilled through the head to put him out of his misery. A slender stem seemed to connect his hanging mouth to the snow, but that was a thin trickle of blood. I fought the supper in my throat. Grandma dropped the fox in the snow and reached for the jawed spring trap that it had caught it, a victor number two, as I would come to know. She pulled herself to her feet to toss the trap into the basket. The walnut holes were to disguise a human scent. So were the rubber chest waders. Oh, I had lots to learn once I was over the first shock. Replacing her glove, she plunged her whole arm into the basket and came up with another trap. She fished for the tuft of rabbit fur and the vial of amber liquid and the picture wire. Then she was down in the snow again, gasping with the work in the cold. Steam rose off her. She wired a trap to a fence post. She stuck the little flag of rabbit fur in the working of the trap and drew the cork from the vial with, from, with her teeth. She'd driven the wooden stake. Now she poured a little of the fluid on it. Grandma, what is that stuff? Fox urine, she said, and set the jaws of the trap. Once more, she dragged herself upright. We moved along the fence. She gave me the trapping basket to carry, making me part of this. She swung the fox by his brush tail after she reloaded the pistol. He's smart, Grandma said, mostly to herself, but teaching me. Wily, he can smell me and I can not smell him. But there's some fox in me and I know how he thinks. He likes fence lines and standing water and ditches, and I need the snow to track him. We came to two more of her traps. I guess I was relieved to see them empty. Then on across another pasture, a trap yielded a fox already dead. Though Grandma was quick on the trigger, I think she was glad of that. I was. She tied her two foxes together with a twine from her pocket. She was never without twine. We followed a fresh track of prints to the edge of the frozen drainage ditch where she set another trap. How quick and sure she worked with those stiff old hands of hers. I was cold right through. We worked back to the road by meandering route, leaving our own tracks behind. Now she had four foxes twined together. When she held them up, you could see how they'd be. Fox furs with glass eyes arranged around some lady's shoulders far from here. The next day, Grandma skinned the foxes and nailed their pelts to the cob house wall. And when the fur broker came around, they did a deal. He tied, tried his best, telling her he was mainly in the market for muskrat and beaver. But she was better with foxes and at driving a bargain. She sold every last skin at her price. This began to clear up the mystery of where Grandma got such ready money as she had. I went out with her many a December night when the snow was on the ground. Something drew me away from the warm stove. I dreaded the scream of a trapped fox, but I've heard it anyway in my head at home. So I'd go out with Grandma to work her traps in the ebony and silver nights. There was little cha changes stirring in me. I began to notice how old Grandma was, how hard she worked herself, how far from town she'd roam in the frozen nights across uneven ground. I began to want to be there with her to make sure she'd come safely home.